In this video, we're going to look at impulse and momentum in two dimensions. The physics hasn't changed going from one to two dimensions. We still have our definition of momentum, how the impulse leads to a change in momentum, and how we can calculate that in terms of our average force. We just have to keep track of the two dimensions, possibly using component notation. We also use the idea that the physics in one Cartesian dimension doesn't affect the physics in the other. So we're going to do this example. I'm not going to read the whole thing right off. You can pause and read it if you'd like, but I'll go through the setup now. So we start with some ball that we're throwing up against a wall. We throw it with an angle theta relative to the vertical, which is 30 degrees, and it comes off at some different angle. We're told that the horizontal component is exactly what it was before in the other dimension, but the vertical component has changed because of a frictional force during the time of contact. We're told that the force lasts a tenth of a second and that it took on a particular shape as a function of time. We want to know the speed and the angle the ball comes off the wall as well as the maximum value of the force and the average value of the force. We're neglecting gravity, but in the end we want to take a look at whether that was a good idea. I'm going to get down some of the things that we know. I've established a coordinate system, and I've rewritten all of the parameters for which we have information. You might ask why I would do that if I just have it already written there. But I find that it's really important to rewrite what I know, because sometimes I'll forget about it if I just read it, and now I have it all together. What sort of physics am I going to apply to this problem? Well, certainly I think impulse and momentum is something we should look at. I'm given information about how the force acts over time. And it is forces that act over time that lead to changes in momentum. And the definition of impulse is in fact that integral of the force over time. So let's look at our velocity and our momentum. I'm given the angle at which it hits the wall. So if I draw a line here so that it makes a right angle, I can find the components of the velocity, which is the magnitude of the velocity sine theta in the x direction, and then cosine theta in the y. You can see if I translate that vector to the tail is at my coordinate system, I can see that both the x and the y component are positive. I can find the two-dimensional momentum vector by simply multiplying my velocity vector by the mass. I want to find the final velocity and the final momentum. So how might I go about doing that? Well, the information I'm given is that the horizontal component simply switches direction. So if the initial x component of the momentum is 2, then the final x component of the momentum is negative 2. From that, I can calculate the change in momentum in the x direction, which is just negative 4, and the units in SI, kilograms, meters per second. Well, I know the x component of the impulse led to this change in the x component of the momentum, and that comes about from the x component of the force. So what do I know about that force? Well, if it's the x component, that means it's normal to the surface. So the x component is going to be the normal component of the contact force of the wall on the ball. And what do I know about it? Well, I know that it lasts for 0.1 seconds, but it also that it has a triangle shape. It's linearly from zero to a maximum value, and then it goes back to zero with the opposite slope that it had before. And so it reaches some maximum value that I've identified here. And of course, I made it below zero because I know that the normal force, given my coordinate system, is pointing in the negative x direction. So the impulse is the integral of that force as a function of time, which is the area underneath that curve. And that's a triangle, so the area is one half the base times the height, which is the maximum of the normal component. So that integral then is equal to the change in momentum, which is negative four, so I can solve for that maximum component, which is a negative 80 newtons. Now I'm not sure if I needed that immediately. I know I needed it eventually, and so I'm sort of accumulating information in my brainstorming stage. I do have a better idea of what's going on with the force now, at least the normal component. So what can I say about the frictional component of the force? 
Well, if I draw a free body diagram for that ball, where I just have the normal force and the frictional force, the frictional force is parallel to the surface, and the normal force is perpendicular, and I know the magnitude of the frictional force will be the coefficient of friction times the magnitude of the normal force. Well, should I go ahead and try to calculate that right away? Not necessarily. What happens if I integrate both sides? Well, I can integrate the frictional force and integrate the normal force, each from 0 to 0.1, and that's just going to give me the change in momentum in the y direction is the integral of the y component of the force is equal to mu then, and this is just the change in the momentum of the x direction, something I've already calculated. So I don't have to do any more calculation. I can go ahead and solve for the change in momentum of y direction immediately. And just to be careful, since I started here, this is only a relationship between the magnitudes, so I have to worry about the signs after the fact. So the magnitude of the change in momentum of the y is equal to the coefficient of friction then, 0.6, times the change in the momentum of the x, which I've already found, which is 4, and so the magnitude is 2.4, and I notice in my diagram that that is going to be in the negative y direction, so the change in momentum will be a negative 2.4 kilograms meters per second. From that, I can calculate the final y component. So the change in the y momentum is equal to the, the final y component minus the initial y component, and I plug in those values from what I've had before, I can find for the final y component of the momentum, which is 1.06 kilograms meters per second. That gives me the final momentum in vector form, from which I can calculate the magnitude of the momentum, which is 2.26 kilograms meters per second, and I can calculate the magnitude of the velocity then by dividing the momentum by the mass. Now I have the speed coming off the wall, but I still needed to find that angle that I had identified as phi earlier. Well, I can come up with that easily enough because I know the components of the momentum, which I can find from this figure because the momentum points in the same direction as the velocity. And so tangent of that angle will be the magnitude of the x component of the momentum divided by the magnitude of the y component of the momentum. When I find components, I always go just to a triangle where I calculate the distances from that triangle where the hypotenuse is the magnitude of the vector and I always worry about signs after the fact. I can see immediately from my triangle that tangent of phi will be the ratio of the magnitudes of these two values. I put in those values and I find that tangent of theta, once I take the inverse tangent of that ratio, is 62.1 degrees. So I found the speed coming off the wall as well as its, as its angle. Next I was tasked to find the maximum force as well as the average force. Well, I had already found the x component of that maximum force, and the maximum force of the frictional component will just be mu times that magnitude, and I've already calculated those values. The maximum of the x component was 80.6 times that is 48, so I can calculate that magnitude, which is 93.9 .9 newtons. Next, we want to find what was the average force that the wall exerted on the ball. I've brought back that graph for the x component of the force, which was the normal force. Remember the average force is the constant force over the same time interval that gives us the same impulse, and we can calculate it using that expression. Since this is just the impulse, this is also equal to the change in momentum over the change in time. And since I have the change in momentum, that seems to be the easiest thing to calculate. The change in momentum from before, the x component of the change in momentum was negative 4, the y component negative 2.4, and I can divide that by the time interval, which was 0.1, and I get a negative 40 i hat minus 24 j hat. This now is the component form of the average force. When compared to the maximum force, it's exactly one half of what we found for the maximum force. And that makes sense because the rectangle 
that would give you exactly the same area as a triangle with the same base would be half the height. We can go ahead and calculate the magnitude of that, and we get a magnitude of 46.6 newtons, which is half what we calculated before, 93.3, and so these checks give us some confidence that we got the right answer. Finally, we noticed that we did not include gravity in this problem. Even though I said we threw the ball vertically against a wall, clearly gravity was acting while it was colliding with the wall. Was it a good idea to exclude it or not? Well, let's take a look at gravity. The force due to gravity, which is the mass times g, is equal to 0.4, which was the mass, times 9.8 meters per second squared. That gives me a force of 3.92 newtons. That's going to be in the vertical direction. And so we can compare that to the y component of the average force, which was negative 40. This would be also negative. So we can see that it's less than 10% of the y component of the original force. So it was quite a bit smaller. And now it depends on what precision you want to be able to calculate the result. But this is part of an important process when we start looking at impulse, momentum, and collisions. Many times these collisions happen very quickly. Here it was a tenth of a second, and sometimes even a hundredth of a second or less. And the internal forces or the forces between the objects can be very, very large compared to the force of gravity and we'll end up neglecting it when we do these calculations.